Funding for this program was provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Stanley Skip Bertman led the LSU Baseball Tigers to five NCAA Baseball Championships, coached Team USA to a bronze medal in the 1996 Summer Olympic Games, and went on to become LSU's Director of Athletics. His passion for baseball began at an early age. I mean, he always was a baseball coach. When I met him, he was a baseball coach and he was always involved with baseball camps or baseball. I don't think he ever wanted to be anything else but a coach. I mean, did we dream of what was going to happen? No. Are we thrilled about it? Yes. And we wouldn't uh, take back a day of anything that has happened. While a student at the University of Miami, Skip earned three letters as a catcher and outfielder, a bachelor's degree, and a master's degree in health and physical education. He was coaching the Hurricanes when LSU recruited him to be the Tigers head coach in 1984. He had goals when he came. As simple as painting the old Alex Box Stadium to bringing a national championship to LSU. And he accomplished all of those. The scratch by Mars on the pitch. Swung on and hit the right field. That's way back there. Way back there. Oh, God! Rockets win! Baseball has been pretty good to Skip. He was named National Coach of the Year a record-breaking six times and built a sports dynasty from a program that barely got any attention at all when he first took the job. And at that time, the baseball program had not evolved into what it, it became. When a gentleman by the name of Skip Bertman arrived here in the early 80s, the program all of a sudden started to catch fire and became what I believe to be the model premier program in the country. When you win five national championships in a 10-year period, that's pretty amazing stuff. And a powerhouse program it certainly became. But more important to the coach than those five championships is the sense that he's built not only a program, but a family with his players. And the fact is he treated every one of his players like a son, and I think that's pretty much like any parent that the guys that he produced as players turned out to be great fathers, great citizens, great husbands, you know, great uh, friends, and uh, successful people in life. And I think for him, that's really what he was in it for, and winning the baseball games was just part of that whole process. Hello, I'm Beth Courtney. Welcome to Louisiana Legends. We are here in this beautiful baseball stadium with a true Louisiana legend, Skip Bertman. And Skip, we're here in a place that some people call it the house that Skip built. Congratulations, it's gorgeous. I uh, thank you very much. It's been a, uh, a great ride and, and a culmination for the most wonderful fans who have filled the old Alec box for 70 plus years. And then, of course, to come over here and see it still filled and still continue winning national championships and records and uh, make enough money to sustain all of this is a wonderful thing. How did you, you were born in Detroit uh, and then moved quickly to Miami. Um, how, how different is your early childhood in Miami from where you are here in Louisiana? It's very, very different. Uh, uh, growing up in Miami, where it seems like nobody was ever born there, they came from New Jersey or New York or some other place, and I was there as a child. So I grew up in Miami, and it's uh, uh, fast-paced, uh, like large cities, and uh, very uh, heterogeneous. Uh, and then, of course, when I came here after living in Miami for 44 years, uh, you know, I came to the airport, and uh, the AD sent a booster to meet me. And he stuck his hand out and he said, Billy Ray Bob. <laughs> and I said, where are the other two guys? You know, because <laughs> it was so new to me. On the other hand, uh, in moving my family up, uh, uh, we saw that the people were just about as nice as it could possibly be uh, at every level, at every turn. And secondly, at the LSU was a wonderful place. I had been here before and I had sensed 
you know, the fact that we could go forward and that we could be champions, uh, that we could be the best, you know, regardless of what other people thought, you know. And sometimes it takes people from the outside of the state to come here with mm -hmm. a different philosophy than those that were lived here all their lives. And I think uh, they gave me the tools and the ammunition, and uh, we were very fortunate to have a lot of good athletes, a lot of good students. Well, when did you personally first fall in love with baseball, if you will, Ooh. Ed? <laughs> uh, I was in baseball, uh, of course, all my life. I think uh, I fall into the category of most coaches. Uh, I knew I wanted to be a coach when I was 14 years old and coached kids that were 10 to 12. Uh, and coached every summer since then for my entire life. Never missed a summer. Uh, I read every book, I spoke to every guy, I drove, I flew, I got anywhere I could to speak with someone uh, uh, or, or clear up something that I read in a book. Uh, it was very important for me to do it right. Uh, uh, I'm an excellence seeker. Uh, I taught high school and I think I did a very good job you know, as a teacher. Uh, you know, in different subjects because it mattered to me, you mm -hmm. know, to be excellent. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I came here, I met a lot of uh, people who were content to be average. And uh, but I showed them some things, and they climbed on my back and said, "Okay." We were talking about that. Uh, aspiring to be average is not in your DNA, is it? No, it really isn't. It, it, it's irritating to hear uh, top politicians in our state say we're going to. We're going to reach the southern average if we pass this. And, uh, you know, that's a hard thing. You know, I think the passion for football here or baseball and other sports, that same passion could be put into education, uh, can be put into health care, can be put into jobs, and many others. There's so many people here, great intelligent people, and we could really do anything. It's not just baseball or football that we can be champions or athletics. We can be champions in anything. Well, you saw what we could be and what you could become and um, I, in this fabulous stadium. How unique is the baseball program here at LSU and the athletic program, well, for that the, matter? Well, the athletic program uh, is, good, is really good. But the uh, baseball program is in a league by itself because it has been the record holder for fans for about 16 years now. And, of course, we'll always hold that record because of the new stadium. And Paul, uh, the coach, does a magnificent job. So uh, I think you said in his game, opening game, you had, or one of his games, you had more than the entire season you had in your first <laughs> season, or something oh, to did. that effect. Yeah. Yeah, we did. We had uh, started, uh, you know, with just a couple of hundred people, and nobody ever went to a game unless they wanted a quiet place to study. <laughs> uh, yes, that would be my era. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, um, the the thing that made it makes it work. Uh, is that baseball players are great representatives of the athletic student body. They sign autographs, uh, they make good grades, they go out into the communities. They're very fortunate in the sense that they do come from mostly two-parent homes and they're uh, wonderful kids that have been trained uh, by parents. And then you come in and you just turn it over and show them how to be champions and what to do with their hands or their feet. And that part is easy, and uh, they love it, and they love the teamsmanship, you see. Uh, I un understand that part of your legendary efforts have been as a motivational speaker. Uh, how important is that envisioning being a champion? And there's some speech that you talk about ropes or something right. to that effect. It's legendary. Well, what's, uh, the, the correct thing, the, the rope story, of course, is a true story. Uh, in the sense that a uh, quick version is uh, I gave them a uh, three-foot rope and I threw it over the edge of my desk and called them in one at a time at the beginning of my tenure. And I said, if I was holding on to this end of the rope and you were holding on to that end, but a thousand-foot fall if I let go, who do you want that you love so much, you trust so much to hold on to this rope? And of course, they knew I was serious and they mentioned a lot of players and, or even me. And uh, when it was over, I said to him, it doesn't really matter uh, who holds on to the rope as long as he's a teammate of mine. See, that will be one. We'll think alike. You know, we'll do things that uh, will be team worthy. And, of course, it takes a couple of years, as it does in all sports, 
and the team, uh, you know, became very, very close. And uh, you have told the rope story many times and uh, continue to tell it. And I think it's a good lesson for anybody in business or in any group uh, to hold on because people need to trust you. But as I look back at the, it has all the winning championship uh, years here on this uh, scoreboard. Six you had as head coach and then one, I guess you were athletic director em emeritus, is that at that well, point? Or, or you were athletic director? I was uh, athletic director. Uh, and of course, Paul uh, did won the championship, and it's wonderful. He's a good coach. What was it like that that very first championship? The exhilaration of the pictures, the still frames of those pictures are just fabulous there in Nebraska. Was it? What was the? Tell us what it was like. Well, first let me say that we were at Omaha, the in Middle America, where the championships are played. Now, nobody from Louisiana had ever been there in baseball at the time I came here, uh, yet alone LSU. And I said to the boys, we're going to go to this place in middle America, and we're going to play for the national championship. I could see it. I could visualize it. I showed them things in the stadium uh, on pictures that I had, and uh, there would be a new scoreboard. There would be 100 seats here, bleachers there, and so on. And all of us are going to do that. You're going to paint. You're going to pick up the rocks. We're all going to do that. We're going to be one and have a great time. And slowly they bought in, you know, one at a time, see, as we move forward. And we went to Omaha four times and didn't succeed as champions, which wasn't enough for me, okay, or my team. And on the fifth time in 1991, we did win. And uh, I must say that uh, the thing that strikes me the most is I had always prepared for that. And I said to myself, uh, when the last out is made, I'll, wa I'll hug all the coaches, and then I'll walk across and shake hands with the other coach, and then I'll meet in the middle of the, stay, the field with all the players. And uh, of course, the last out was made by Chris Mook over to John Telechia. We were the champions, and sure enough, all the boys reached in, all the coaches. And then I walked across, and Beth, as I walked across, I thought to myself, gosh, I've done this hundreds of times. But I had, you see. I had visualized this hundreds and hundreds of times. And I shook hands with the other coach and went out and jumped around with the boys. And uh, when the TV thing came and the lady said to me, as they always do, you know, what do you think? And of course, I had a prepared, you know, 30, 40 second blurb. And I'll never forget this uh, female reporter, uh, you know, she gave it to me and I said, and all the people of Louisiana, and I turned back to the camera and she was kind of surprised, <laughs> you know, because you know, I had it all memorized, you see. Right. And you know, then so it wasn't out of the realm of winning again, you see, mm -hmm. uh, you know, mm -hmm. or even some times that we I practiced being a winner. We practiced it often with the Olympic right. team. We did stuff like that. You know, we went into the stadium and we practiced, you know, pr pr playing at eight o'clock in the morning, which we might have been for the Olympic team when I was a coach, or other kinds of things, you know, because we visualized it. Now many people tell these stories, and many books are written about these kinds of things. But unless it happens to you, I guess you, you may not be a believer. But uh, you know, two things have always worked for me. I could get for my team, my family, for LSU, whatever I wanted, if I could help enough other people, you know, get what they wanted. And the second thing was is uh, I always believed, you know, that if if you could uh, see it, you know, you could achieve it. Tell us about your experience as being coach of the Olympic team. How was that different? Well, it was great. I was an Olympic coach uh, three times, twice as an assistant, and once as the head coach in 1996 in Atlanta. And that is different. And, of course, all the players, although there were two players from LSU, uh, the other 18 players from other universities uh, are great players, many of whom are still in the major leagues today because they were the best, of course. And uh, that was a lot of fun. And playing for the USA, mm -hmm. you know, in that sense, everybody played for the name on the front of the shirt as opposed to the, their own individual name on the back of the shirt. And uh, that was easy. Uh, but uh, the competition was extraordinarily tough. We were still in the amateur phase, so all our kids were college kids. And we faced guys 35 or 34 that had played, you know, and of course Cuba in particular was better than us. Some of the other, Japan and some of the other teams, they were physically better. But they always did a great job. And 
when they revamped in 2000 and Tommy Lasorda coached the team with professionals and our own Louisiana Ben Sheets pitched, uh, they beat Cuba and used wooden bats and it was a lot e more equal. Mm -hmm. But we lost the amateur thing what? and you can't have everything, but it was a great win. Did you ever want to be a player yourself? Uh, I Yes, of course I started out to be a uh, major leaguer like all kids right. and probably would have done that except for a tragic lack of ability. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, did manage to go to the University of Miami and play baseball and but I always knew I wanted to coach and I really wasn't interested at that time when I was 21 or 22 or 23. Uh, I wanted to be a teacher and I wanted to coach and I wanted to coach and teach and so as soon as I got out of school I couldn't get a job in high school and I had an elementary school job and I was really upset uh, but I it was kind of, I was a physical education teacher at two different places. And my second school is where I met Sandy. She was a, you know, a first grade teacher. Sandy, your lovely wife, yeah. yeah. 48 years now. <laughs> and so it was a blessing, you know, because the Lord always gives you a blessing, you know, if you believe. And the, you know, that we were engaged, you know, by November, that was August and married the same year in uh, February. It's been, as I said, 48 years, four uh, children, four grandchildren, and I've been super blessed. Do you keep in touch with uh, many of your former players? Yes, I, uh, uh, it was important to grow a family-like atmosphere, kind of like Les Miles does, and uh, to make sure that the kids you know, come through the system and they'll always be part of the system because they never get big heads, they never forget where they came from. And uh, I like that. I like to be with them. Well, of course, you love baseball and coaching baseball, but then you were asked to be, be athletic director, and then you have to embrace all your children equally, I guess. <laughs> I, I, although football seems to be king well, in Louisiana. Yes, How hard is. was that transition okay. to being athletic director? Well, it depends. Uh, here, here's the thing. I, I knew exactly what it was like to be the athletic director. I've been doing this in college for 40 years. I've been through 12 or 14 athletic directors. I know exactly what it is. Football is king, okay, and will always be the king, and that's not a problem for me. I mean, to get 92,000 or 110,000 at a weekend, it's just a wonderful thing. Plus, I knew the athletic department could reach a point where it wouldn't take a tax dollar or a student dime, yet alone university money, but could give back millions of dollars to the university. And I said to the people, uh, we can be champions in all sports, but you have to pay. Mm -hmm. See, and we ha so we added a surcharge to the football tickets. We were the only school in the conference that didn't have that. And the people did it. There that seems strange. Well, we were, you know, the way it was is a tradition. Mm -hmm. you know? Tradition is important in yeah. Louisiana. Right. And I had a breakdown. I say to them, look, we can win, but you got to pay. See, we got to buy, we got to build things. And uh, so everybody paid. There wasn't an email to the Board of Supervisors, and everybody paid. And of course, built into that were further payments in addition. We were fortunate to have a good football program, uh, and the prior coach, Nick Saban, was fortunate enough to win. And then the people said, well, I guess he's right. Maybe that's what it takes. Well, that money allowed us to build the academic center, which was a, a pearl of the thing. And then it allows us to build a football operations center. Uh, those things allowed us to build this baseball field, the basketball addition, and fix the PMAC, you know, after 40 years. Um, you can have that, but you had to pay a little more. Okay, now we have it. All 20 teams go to the playoffs. Well, if people expect excellence yeah. in athletics in Louisiana. Why don't they have the same feel for academics? Well, I that's a great question, uh, Beth. Uh, uh, you know, I've said to many uh, of the 144 politicians and meeting with them individually, you know, having a good athletic program won't diminish academics. It will, in fact, enhance it. See? And, they, and I've convinced them that that was okay. And then I said to them, we could be number one in academics as we are in some specific areas, uh, for example, at LSU, and I don't want to say, uh, you know, which one or offend anybody that, that I'm leaving out. But we are terrific in some areas. We could be terrific in all the areas, but you have to think in those lines and you have to pay for it. 
You see, that, that's a problem because our budget doesn't allow that because uh, there's cuts to hospitals, cuts to education. There's 16 universities and maybe we should have only eight, you know, uh, with our population. And, and then there are things, but that doesn't mean it can't be done. It, it's hard to do, but we could do it. I mean, we're, we're very talented here and, and uh, an incredibly passionate people. Well, Skip, certainly one of the biggest challenges for the whole state and here at LSU was um, the immediate aftermath of Katrina. Uh, tell us what that was like. Uh, that was new for everybody. In, in all, from beginning to end, I was never more proud of LSU, Not, uh, the university and its emergency procedure group. Uh, the chancellor and the police and all of the people. I was never more proud of a football coach or any coach. Les Miles just was magnificent. It was his first year. It was confusing. He was asked to cancel the game, play different times, play a road and do everything. Never lost his uh, composure one time. It was a wonderful thing for all the players who took all of their uh, gear and went over to the PMAC and just walked around and gave out their gear. And they really saw what was important. And they saw a life lesson that, that fortunately, I hope, it'll never be repeated. Uh, but they learned something then. And sometimes the thing we forget is young people at a university are just that. They're young people. They're not professional. You know, it's true. And, you know, many, I shouldn't leave students out. Many students did great <laughs> things. Community members did great things, too. They, everything was sending blankets, you know, to actually being there to do something. Uh, the police were terrific, firefighters, rescue people, but the, the uh, helicopters that continued to come and land on the track and the ambulance sirens went 24 hours a day. And if you were on the campus, you couldn't help but, but being touched by all of this. And if you were in a pressure spot like the football team, you couldn't help but be touched, but they handled both magnificently. They ended up 11 and two, and naturally the people weren't satisfied with that. And I can understand that. But if you knew what the coach accomplished and what the players learned, you'd have to be satisfied. Skip, when I was reading about all your wonderful victories and, and thinking about all the high points in, in, in your life, you've had so many. Is there any one moment that stands out for you? That if you could say, you know, sort of this is your life, you, know, you look back and you say, if I could look at this one moment in time, what would it be? You know, uh, a lot of people <laughs> have uh, asked that. And the people assume that I'm going to answer that Warren Morris hitting a home run in the bottom of the ninth in 1996 to win the ch national championship from behind, the only time that it's ever been done in the history of college baseball, and really the only time in baseball except for Bill Mazarowski in 1960, that because of its unusualness, that would be the one. But the truth is, uh, I, I just don't see it like that. That was Warren's moment. And uh, he's a wonderful kid and deserve that more than most kids. He's really spiritual and a great athlete. And I was the beneficiary. But of all of the things that, uh, that I'm the most proud of, uh, wouldn't be just one day. You know, it would be the, the system that I am planted into the baseball and then ultimately into the athletic department that allows people to be the best that they can be allows them to think and dream and wish and hope and, and know that these things can come true, uh, to help other people and to do those things. Uh, to me, that's what the, it's bringing the team together that's the highlight for me. It's not the finished product alone. The highlight is, and boy, when they come together at that moment, you know, at the specific time, at the specific degree, at the specific moment, you know, it's just such a wonderful thing for a team leader. What, what are you looking forward? What's your next vision of what you want to do? Uh, I uh, retired and uh, will still do anything for LSU and done a few things and will do whatever they ask. They're very good to me and the people have been wonderful. Uh, I want to spend a lot of time with my grandchildren, but they grew old. <laughs> they're older and they're not so sure that Papa's the guy to be with as opposed to some of their teenagers. must be teenagers. Teenage. <laughs> or teenage friends. Then I can understand that. Okay. But the, uh, but I thought I'd, I'd stay calm, you know, and wait and see, and 
So I've done a lot of consulting. Uh, maybe too much. You know, I have to hold back a little bit because I don't want to okay. under deliver and promise a lot, but promise a lot and over deliver. And uh, I don't want to do that, so I don't want to take too many. But I'm working for some companies as spokesperson uh, that have to do with uh, business procurement or speeches, you know, or radio or television. And I'm having a lot of fun with that. Well, um, we congratulate you on all that you have accomplished, and uh, you have certainly changed our lives and certainly the face of athletics forever at LSU, and um, you join a great group of Louisiana legends, and we thank everyone at home for uh, joining us for this edition. I'm Beth Courtney, and it has been my pleasure to interview Skip Bertman, a Louisiana legend. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or go online to www.lpb.org. Funding for this program was provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.